Ellie, hi, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I am excited to be here too. And I'm excited to chat to you because you might not know this, but we have a few similarities, a few synergies in our, um, I guess, stories. First of all, my husband is half Colombian. And so my mother-in-law is from Colombia. And we have a lot of that kind of like link in our general day-to-day well not day-to-day but you know life and then secondly last year my husband and I spent a year in R&D developing a non-alc wine company so I'm so familiar with your brand I had you know been totally immersed in the industry for about a year in the end we decided not to pursue it it didn't make sense financially and it was just so bloody hard so I'm really excited to dig into your story and how you've kind of made it work and learn all about Caleno. Do you want to start by giving us a little introduction to who you are and what the brand is? Yeah, sure. Thank you for that, by the way. Amazing to be talking to you. My name's Ellie and I started a brand called Caleno. I launched it almost four years ago now, so just right at four years. And I used to work in the drinks industry and then, yeah, discovered this world of of non-alcoholic drinks or or not. It didn't really exist at the time and felt like there was definitely a space for it. So I've been running this business for about four years. I've done every job pretty much. I've worn different hats in the business, but I've always been known as as the founder. I started it on my own and and now have a team around me, which is amazing. So cool. It's interesting that, you know, Four years ago, like you said, it was kind of not really a a well-known category. You were really on the cusp of this, what's now a booming trend, well, not even a trend, but a booming category. So I can only imagine that back then it must have taken a lot more education in the market and a lot more persistence to kind of get this thing out there and to gain such, you know, enormous, the enormous traction that you have. Where do you like to start your story? What's the light bulb that kind of went off for you that got you thinking about building Caleno? A lot of people, funny enough, ask me this. For me, it was actually wine back around five years ago. I still worked in the drinks industry, but very much on the alcohol side. I was working for a drinks distributor at the time who sold predominantly alcohol to bubs, pubs, bars and restaurants all over the UK. And I worked in their, in their marketing team. And I think working in a in a booze and company, you just end up drinking a lot, basically, because all the social events will revolve around drinking. I learned so much about that world and you know the nuances of spirits. I did training on wine and spirits, and I found it fascinating. You get to meet some of the people that create these products. Back in 2017, uh, at the start of 2017, I think I had quite a boozy Christmas. I was getting towards my 30s, was late 20s at the time, and thinking. I just can't, I can't deal with it anymore. I can't deal with the hangovers. Um, I can't deal with like the next day anxiety. And I really just felt like coming into the new year, I wanted to take a bit of a break, which is difficult, right? When you work for an alcohol company, but I decided to do a little challenge called Dry January. And I was quite adamant that I didn't want this to change my habits, like not go out socializing with my friends just because I wasn't drinking. So I still went out, met my friends and I can remember one night in, in Bristol, city in the UK, where I lived, um, being out with my friends. It was a fun night. It was a music night. We went to see a live band. They were at the bar ordering. They weren't taking part in dry January. It was just me. <laughs> so much for solidarity. <laughs> and they were at the bar ordering, I think, gin tonics, cocktails. And I was stuck there with a pint of Diet Coke. And then I think I ordered another one. And then after that, I was like, I really don't want to drink this all night. So I just switched to water. Yeah, you're like, I can't drink this anymore. (laughs) I didn't know what to order. And it was like that moment when you go to the bar and you panic. And you're like, well, I don't want any any of that sugary stuff or the stuff that kids order, like J2Os and squashes. So I was kind of stuck. And throughout the month, I kept having very similar experiences just coming up against it whenever I went to order a drink, I would normally end up drinking something I didn't want to just because I felt like I was being punished just because I didn't want to drink alcohol. These were my options. So I kind of got thinking about that and how the drinks industry is so innovative. One of the most exciting industries, in my opinion, to to be in, yet they got it really wrong when it came to non-alcoholic drinks and people didn't want to drink. 
And as far as I can see, me in my kind of late twenties actually wanting to cut back, and maybe start to live a little bit of a healthier lifestyle. And the more and more people I spoke to, they agreed with me. Um, and so this kind of sparked the idea, which then eventually led to Colenio, but this idea of why aren't there better options available? Why are we still still drinking Coke, squash, J2O, um, elderflower, cordials? Like why why is this still happening? And what I really wanted were these grown up flavoursome well-made drinks whether it's cocktails or spirit with a mixer which was which is what i tended to drink what i really wanted was that taste and flavor profile just without the alcohol and so that that's that's kind of what sparked the idea and, and got me thinking about it and, and researching and, and looking into the space a bit more because i just couldn't i couldn't understand why there wasn't more available had you always seen yourself as someone who wanted to start a business were you wanting to be an entrepreneur or had you kind of just come across this realization light bulb moment and decided like hey maybe I could be the person to start this thing I think like everyone you know when people you know you always say oh wouldn't it be nice to start a business and then you know it never ends up being anything or you think oh I've not come up I've not come up with the right idea yet I definitely was in a space where I was looking for what's next I wanted to progress in my career. To date, I'd followed like quite a linear path. I'd always progressed. I think I'd had about four different positions in the company I was in, in like a relatively short space of time. So I was always looking to progress. And I was kind of looking for the next thing. And it didn't feel like the next thing was was in that company. I really wanted to grow a brand and um, go out there and say, I've done this. But I kind of looked at brand manager roles and, you know, brands that already existed. And I kept getting knockbacks. I kept getting told, oh, you don't have experience because the work I did was very B2B as opposed to B2C. So I kept getting told when I would go for interviews with, you know, beer companies or you know, within the drinks industry because I love the space, I got told, um, you know, I always got beaten by, by someone who had more experience in that area. And so I think I just ended up getting quite frustrated and, and kind of, saying to myself if no one will give me a job then I'm gonna just go out and create my own role for myself which is what I ended up doing so yeah I think I fell into it because of really from necessity and frustration in my situation of wanting to to do something and, and grow something and having said i had done it but not being given the opportunity so kind of took that narrative and and took control of it if if you know what I mean and launching a business felt like the best solution. Absolutely. Best experience you can get, <laughs> for sure. 100%. 100%. I wish I'd done it earlier. <laughs> In those early days of kind of having the idea and coming up with the concept, you know, for me, when I look back at my journey going through the non alk wine, which is such a complicated process, the R&D was just, it was just madness. For you in those early days, what was the R&D part of this story and what was the process for you coming up with a formula and kind of developing your first product yeah good question so it started with me going to the internet as I said like I did have a bit of training in in spirits I'd done what's called your WFET which is your spirits and and wine training so I understood how the process of how they were made and I kind of thought okay well I just need to apply that to what I'm trying to do but just not be left with a flavoured alcohol at the end of it which ended up proving harder than I thought I mean I went online I bought different botanicals that I knew about that I thought would would be great as ingredients and and I tried to distill the flavour in my kitchen at home like heating them um putting small amounts of alcohol to try and extract the flavor I spent about a month or two doing this and, and going back and forth and then I just hit a wall and I was like I just don't have the expertise needed to, to move this forward I felt stuck and um, so I ended up finding someone on LinkedIn of all places um, she was a beverage uh, development specialist who actually lived close to me and so I contacted her and, and told her what I was looking to do. And she was like, look, this hasn't been done before. She didn't say, yeah, absolutely, I can do this. She was like, we can figure this out together, how we do this. You know, me know, having a good idea of what I wanted the blend to taste like and the different distillates and ingredients to include, but not really knowing how to get there. And also, I didn't just want this to be a kitchen product. I knew this could be big. I could see the potential to really change 
the drinks industry and, and how we thought about not drinking. So I always wanted this to be big. So it, knowing that from the beginning meant I needed to get someone with expertise in this area, creating a, a safe non-alcoholic drink that would be safe for people to consume, um, but also get the flavours coming through so that people don't just drink it and go, this is squash or this doesn't taste of anything or the flavours just get lost. I, it was really important to me that it was going to be a great tasting product. So that process basically took a year and a half, more or less. Um, I was still in my job at this point. So anytime I um, I could, I would meet up with, with this person and we basically um speak to different companies order different distillates and, and start blending you can go really specific on provenance of ingredients and where they come from and a type like you know one flavor of pineapple can be super different to to another same with coconut you can kind of get toasted coconut flavors and and so it was a lot of experimentation and a lot of going back and forth and a lot of talking to, to bartenders and literally going to restaurants and bars with my bottles and getting feedback and then going back and, and iterating. And were you thinking of this as kind of like going down the retail distribution pathway from the get-go or were you thinking about this business as a D2C or, you know, kind of starting small locally at farmers markets and things like that and kind of selling directly through your own website? I think with the big business, I've always thought big. I've always, from the very beginning, I wanted this to be a global business. I'm probably not over like over-egging it when I say there just really wasn't much available and I could see the potential. Uh, I didn't jump straight to retail. I thought potentially we were a bit early for that. I thought about bars and restaurants. So actually seeding the idea with those guys and, and getting using them to get feedback and really seed the, the product with consumers and then also GDC. So that's actually where I, I launched first of all was, was online with my own website. First version a friend created for me. A second version was like I think I paid like five thousand pounds for a guy to kind of build it all for me. And then you know you go from better versions, but it was definitely GDC first and get get consumers buying the product and then and then build it out from there but didn't quite go the plan that ended up happening wasn't quite the plan that I first what's the plan that ended up happening <laughs> versus the plan you thought so the plan that ended up happening was I'd met someone about six months prior to launching I'd gone along to a festival a drinks festival it's called the mindful drinking festival run by guys called club Sodi, who you may have heard of in your kind of non-alcoholic wine experimentation days but they were basically big champions for people in the non-alcoholic industry and you know really pushing consumers to try these products so I went along with 20 bottles I'd made at home just to get feedback from people there I met someone from Sainsbury's you know a retailer in the UK and he said to me he really liked the product he was obviously there I guess scouting for, for different drinks and, and looking at this category as kind of an emerging space said he really liked the product and would be in touch on Monday and I was so skeptical I was like retailers don't just walk up to you and, and say they'll be in touch the next day that's <laughs> yeah that's amazing but he did he got in contact and at that point like I said I had 20 bottles I was still kind of blending it in my kitchen and this is pre-launch right this is totally pre-launch pre-launch and then as as the the months progressed I was getting closer and closer to doing my first run of a thousand bottles and he gets in contact uh, this is close to Christmas now. He said, look, buyer is looking at this category and um, she wants to start stocking non-alcoholic options in store. Why don't you send in a few bottles? So I did. And I hear back and basically to cut a long story short, they want to put Kalenu in 500 of their stores nationwide. Whoa. Whoa. That's what I mean by unexpected. That is crazy. <laughs> That's the dream. Oh, my gosh. That's a whole other logistical <laughs> supply chain craziness. Oh my gosh. Okay. I have a few more questions before we even get to what that means and how that changes the course of your, you know, the next phase of your launch, I guess. How were you thinking about the money piece of the puzzle? Obviously it can be expensive when it comes to R&D consultants, working with people in that space, then producing the MOQs. Um, the bottles, the bottling, and kind of, you know, the website and getting everything ready to launch. So I'd love to talk about 
the money piece of the puzzle, how much capital you needed to get started and how you were thinking about the money piece and how you were going to kind of build a business. I had the idea in 2017, worked on it for about a year and a half. And during that time, I was um, still working. I knew that was holding me back. I was getting up early in the morning at five, working my business, going to work, coming back, working on, on this idea. Um, but I knew I needed more time in order to kind of make it work. So I needed to be able to go full time. I had a mortgage, you know, I had financial commitments. So I couldn't do that without without a bit of cash. And I had my own money that was putting into the business. I think in total, I put it like in total around 10,000 10, pounds is what got me um, to a liquid, to kind of a, a prototype product. I was pretty fortunate on the branding side, somewhere that I'd interned at like a great agency in London where I'd interned a few years before, offered to do the work, the branding work pro bono, which was a massive stroke of luck for me because that would have been a big chunk of my budget. So I was really scrappy in the beginning, but with about 10 grand, I managed to, to do what I needed to get the, like the whole business to a place where I could put it in front of investors. And then, you know, when I was speaking to Sainsbury's, I, I quickly realized I'm going to need I'm going to need cash to fund quite a large production, the marketing spend that inevitably comes with launching with a large retailer and also some people. I was a solo founder, so I didn't have anyone working with me at the time. So it started with a um, you know, small amount of money, you know, less than 10,000. And then I um, my first round of investment was a quarter of a million to basically the runway being like uh, 12 months to kind of ideally last me for help me bring in a few staff on the operations and marketing side and sales to fund that first round of production and any marketing spend and also help me market the product and get it out there because food and drink is so competitive you do need to to market the product to get it out there and, and do sampling and events like I spent my first few months just running around with a bar or driving around with a bar in my car and then just kind of trying to get the product out there. That's kind of what the first first bit of money looked like. When you went through that raise, you know, we've heard horror stories of people, you know, having 200 meetings before they get their first yes. And it's very difficult. It can be very difficult in the beginning, but hearing your story and knowing that you had that, you know, PO from Sainsbury's of 500 stores did that make the experience a little easier to go out and raise by having that kind of traction that you could show as as proof or was it still the hard slog <laughs> it's still a hard slog and it's still a lot of preparation you still have to build out the plan you still have to show that you thought 12 months ahead that you know you have a vision for where the company is going and and you thought about it. I think the hardest part is for me was that I've never done any of that stuff before so I was learning and then having to do it. And so it was stuff that didn't come naturally to me. So it probably just took longer. I had to ask a lot more questions. Um, but but definitely, I think having commitment from a national retailer saying that, you know, they want to stock your product really helps when it com comes to investment. So and it, it's really clear how, you know, being really clear on how the money is going to be spent. But I think I would say that going in as a solo female entrepreneur on my own with zero experience in business definitely at a time stood against me I think there were there were a few questions raised around my age and you know you know would I be able to do this and to that point I'd not really thought about you know going into a business solo on my own not really thought about the fact I was female and it's only really when you start to experience investment boards and um you know people in the space and, and going out to pitch that, that you start to realize this is quite unusual, um, or it was at the time, and we're talking, you know, four, four or five years ago now. Fortunately, it is changing, maybe not quick enough, but at the time it was it was quite unusual to see a young girl on her own pitching for quite a large amount of money with no experience. Um, so there was a lot of belief there. Gosh, isn't it so bizarre? So bizarre, obviously, that it seems like it's slowly starting to shift, even though the statistics are so you know, low still about the amount of funding that goes to female founders. But hopefully it is trending in the right direction. And as we know, there are so many more female founded businesses coming out. But still, it's such, it's so cringe hearing those questions that you get asked around gender and can you do this? And it, it doesn't seem like it would happen if you were a guy to be asked those kinds of questions. Yeah, it generally just feels like women have to prove themselves more 
I definitely felt like I had I had to prove myself. That was the underlying feeling, like I had to prove myself. When you were going through that process, you mentioned, you know, obviously you didn't really know what you were doing. You were just figuring it out by learning as you go. Were there any kind of resources or courses or grants or things that you were turning to that other founders might be able to look to as go-to resources? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I looked for local grants. I looked for local resources or you know, just national ones as well. And I got some of them too. I think we... You know, we're really lucky, um, well, particularly in the UK, that there are people available and companies available to kind of encourage entrepreneurship and help you. I went along to workshops to understand more about business and, and financials, which I wasn't particularly strong in. It wasn't like my my strong suit, but suddenly I was in a position where I had to understand a profit and loss, a balance sheet, and didn't know how to. So I just took advantage um, of as much as I could and um, spoke to people that were further along the journey than me. I think that can really help. And, and later down the line, I think being part of communities, with communities, you've got people that are super early on in the stage and people that are later on. So now where I am, I'm you know four years into running my business, I can offer help to people that are just at the start. Um, so I definitely lent on that a little bit more. I think you know, just ask people. The worst they can say is, no, I don't have time or I don't want to. But generally, I find people want to help if they can. Um, but just keep an eye out for, for any re- free resources because you just don't know what a difference it could potentially make. And whenever I got grant money, like, I was like, great, I can put that towards this bit of marketing or use that to do some more R&D on on product. So it can make a real difference. Yeah, absolutely. Gosh, very cool. I want to dig more into now kind of the launch period, especially that first year in business where you've obviously launched into 500 stores, you are going all ham in marketing. I'd love to understand what you were doing around the launch, what was working and kind of what your focus was to, you know, get your first customers through D2C and kind of, I mean, this is a so many part question, but also to make sure that your marketing was working for Sainsbury's as well. You know, resource was super tight. So when I launched for about three, four months, I was on my own. Everything I was doing, I had to manage myself effectively. So I think for my marketing, it meant just being quite laser focused in what I was doing and and not trying to do it all so it meant like not having lots of different social media accounts it meant like not trying to do loads and loads of festival and events a because I couldn't afford it and b I was just one person so I tried to be quite laser focused on what I was doing so three things I did Uh, one was collaborations so it was speaking to other brands that had bigger followings than me and had custom, like you know a solid customer base that were in the kind of same health wellness space where I thought colonials and non-alcoholic spirit would appeal to people um, but also felt in keeping with the brand so I teamed up with um, healthy crisp brand called Emily's Vegetable Crisps um, a soda drink can company that had like a tropical soda that I linked up with as served um, I went down to Pineapple Studios um, because I really wanted the, the brand to be about dancing and fun and, and the experience as opposed to just like the drinking. And, and there was this problem I found that when you talked about not drinking, people just assumed that you were going to be really dull and boring and not be able to have, have a fun night out. So I kind of purposely chose brands that were like Kalenia, quite vibrant, quite colourful, quite out there and collaborated with them in January so the only card I had to play what kind of collaboration so we would run social competitions um so basically to boost that Kalenio's following and then offer prizes at the end of it and um, so that was one way giveaways you know that kind of thing that worked really well because at the time I didn't have I didn't really have anyone following me no one knew about the brand I needed to get the word out there because I was going into 500 stores. Um, so that that was kind of the, the first way to do it. The other way was I reached out to a load of influencers. Um, so probably people at the time, this was back in 2019, with maybe anywhere between you know, a few thousand to 20, 30, 50,000 followers. 
And again, the only card I had to play was that it was dry January. And I knew that a lot of people would be taking part in dry January. This is when I launched. Um, so I messaged a load of, of people and said, look, I'm launching this, this new brand and basically offered to send them out some bottles. And if they liked about it, then please feel free to post. So again, that was like leveraging their followings and people that they would post to that might be interested in in the space and and might be taking part in dry january so again that was another way of, of getting the word out and the third one was just sampling was getting people to try the products the our bottles are 18 pounds uh, a bottle so they're not it's not like buying a chocolate bar for a couple of pounds or a bag of crisps um, you're parting with a bit more cash so a lot of the time people want to try something before before they buy it at that price point so i was going into sainsbury's stores and doing samplings at the front of the store i got like a lot of really skeptical people thinking what's the point but you know why would i not want to drink alcohol and i talk to them and, and actually it was funny seeing the turnaround and people that were really skeptical would then end up leaving with a bottle <laughs> so um that was quite fun. <laughs> yeah. Actually really interested. <laughs> yeah. And just going, just driving around to different markets and, and places in London, just trying to get the word out. So January was a big month for me because I knew that that was when a lot of people would be taking part in the challenge or, you know, just trying to to take a step back from alcohol, maybe after having quite a boozy Christmas like I had had a couple of years before. So those were the, those were the three kind of main things I focused on. And then once London came through, I also started spending more money on social media advertising, which at the time, you know, worked really well in kind of getting, just getting exposure out to thousands and sometimes millions. Yeah, gosh, how times have changed when it comes to Facebook and Instagram ads. <laughs> God damn it. As you've kind of progressed, you know, in the last couple of years from the, you know, that first year to now, what are the kinds of exciting marketing initiatives that you're doing to stand out and what are the growth drivers that you pull now to continue to grow? We launched in 2019 and, and as we know 2020 was was COVID quite early, quite early on the year we got we got hit by the pandemic. Our first year, summer was a really important time for us. We have as a as a non athletic brand, we have different peaks in the year. Like January is a is a big time for us. So it makes sense to spend a lot of money then. We dabbled in in a couple of events in summer, the first year we launched. But to be honest, where the brand has really come alive with its marketing has been this year, when we've been able to go out and meet people in real life. So at the start of this year, you know, we're kind of, well, we're kind of out of lockdown, sort of. Anyway, there's a moment where I'm talking to the team, we've got a huge campaign planned we've got a massive bright yellow bus that's going to drive around the country dropping off bottles of Plenye and we're going to do these um, big um, sampling activities in three key cities so uh, London, Bristol and Manchester up in the north and so we've got it planned and then we're kind of hearing right after Christmas that um things are going to be shut down we're kind of heading back into into covid i'm like oh my god no this is terrible and so we have to make a bit of a call do we pull it do we lose money or, or do we try and, and pivot and i think the fact that we were we were still really small we could be quite agile so we changed those plans slightly so that we could do the sampling outdoors where it you know we were still early on in january and people were still out shopping doing their you know their January sales shopping so we got to sample with a hell of a lot of people we got the bus out there I think a lot of brands were were afraid of, of spending money at that time we didn't really see many other brands doing anything so I think for that reason we got a lot of impact and a lot of cut through because we were quite bold in going yes we're, we're still going to go ahead and do this and and go for it and then it, it's just built from there we then did our biggest ever summer campaign this year called um say yes to a summer of no regrets and that's really the sentiment there is going go out live your best life don't worry about hangovers just like enjoy it and you know drinking cleaners it's not about sobriety and and just completely switching off the alcohol it's there to help people that that want to moderate and maybe like me want to drink less alcohol but want to have a great option when when they choose to do that so we went out as a big campaign 
it was again a bit of a, a risk because we we decided to spend big on out of home media. Um, I think we reached like 60 million people impressions wise across the UK. We went to 50 different locations. Um, we we bought a an old Defender that we repainted. We now call her Shakira, and she's like our cocktail sampling truck that's driven all around the country oh my god that sounds so fun yeah and then we sampled we sampled like seventy thousand people already this year so it this year was like a really big bold year for us in marketing i think just having a couple of years where we couldn't really do much and our hands were a bit tied like colonia is a really in-person brand when people show up and we give them a drink there's music there there's, there's quite often dancers there's a bit of an atmosphere and we couldn't do that very well virtually. It was a real struggle to bring that to life. And I was sick of telling people you can have fun when when you don't drink. But I needed we needed to show people. And so this was our way of showing people and changing perceptions. So I think for me that's been the kind of proudest moments um, for me and the team in terms of our marketing. Wow, that sounds so much fun and so exciting to kind of what I also love about this is like you know, you always think that you're going to launch a brand and everything's going to happen straight away, but things do take time. It does take years of building the foundations and setting the tone of the brand to then have your kind of pivotal key year that kind of really kicks things off and kicks it, kicks it into the next level. As you look to the future, what are the kinds of things that you're getting excited about now? Oh, excitement. I mean, I'm excited most of the time because I love I love the industry that I'm working in and I've got a great team. I'm really excited currently about the bar and restaurant industry opening back up because, again, I talk about experience, but really people go out to restaurants, bars and pubs to really get an experience they can't get at home. And that's meeting with friends family great food great great drinks and a, a really great atmosphere and that's not a channel that we've been able to to play in for for a, a long time now in fact just before the pandemic hit we were just starting to make inroads so that's a channel i'm really excited about that to help us bring the brand to life um at the start of the year we were in less than a handful of markets we're now kind of rapidly increasing to 30 40 markets towards the end of this year so that's huge for us um, and some really some really big markets as well so I'm really interested to learn about how the non-alcoholic industry is going to mature in other markets and what learnings we can take from the UK and what will be different because there's going to be different nuances so that's also really exciting because like I said from the beginning I wanted this to be a global brand so it feels like that dream is being realized but to what you said before it does take time I remember the first year going I'm working so hard I'm doing all this stuff and it you know nothing's really changing but now I you know I meet people for the first time like, I've heard of your brand or I've tried it or I've bought it from you know one of the retailers that, that we that we work with so just like gradually that awareness grows and all of the effort that you're putting in does pay off but it takes you know unless you're super lucky and you know, your brand just takes off which is really rare by the way really rare. <laughs> um it does take kind of quite a lot of hard graft and work but I'm excited to see the progress that's happening gosh me too I'm so excited for you holy moly what advice can you give to founders who are just getting started and entering into the beverage industry whether it's in alk or non-alk what I would say to, to anyone starting out is just grasp every opportunity that comes your way don't be afraid of failure because I think people who are afraid of failure eventually it ends up holding you back and meaning that, that you don't do things like it's okay to fail and learn from it and then and then try again I think advice to people maybe starting out in the drinks industry or, or food and drink be tenacious don't take no for an answer and be curious ask questions meet people grow your network for me building a network in the space has been hugely valuable I think I often say work with people they enjoy working with so it can go a long way just being a nice person and helping and and you know eventually that will come back around it's kind of good calm right and I think specifically to female entrepreneurs I think in the beginning I was maybe afraid to be confident and bold in in my opinions or my assumptions and I think having my own business has shown me that actually I can do this and I'm, I'm very capable 
And I think quite often, particularly women, they lack that because it, it can sometimes take time to build up that confidence. But hopefully what this podcast will show you and all the other amazing women that have been on here is that we, we're capable of so much. So having that, that confidence, even if you have to feign it sometimes, just go in and just be bold. And you know, if you're pitching for investment or you're pitching for a new customer, just have that belief in you that it's going to be OK. Love that. Thank you so much for sharing. At the end of every episode, we ask a series of six quick questions, some of which we might have asked, some of which we might not have, but we just cover them all the same anyway. So question number one is, what's your why? Why are you waking up every single day and focusing on building this business? To make not drinking fun for people. I think for so long, it's held the stigma that it's not. Um, it's changing and I've seen it change drastically in the last five years, but we still have a long way to go globally. So for me, that that's what keeps me driven and keeps me focused every day. Amazing. Question number two is what's been your favorite marketing moment so far? I think me driving a giant yellow double decker bus around London. <laughs> which You were driving the bus? Uh, for certain parts, not for most of it. <laughs> what? Oh my God, that's so cool. Did you have to get a special license or were you just allowed to drive the bus? I think it was in a car park, so it was okay. <laughs> we, uh, we had like giant slogan on it saying, say no to another soft drink. And it was basically getting people to just think about their choice. Like, of course, people need to drink water and, and people can drink soft drinks. But yeah, leave those for lunchtime. Like, upgrade your choice when it comes to non-alcoholic drinks in the evening. So we were quite bold. And that's, I think that was a big moment for us. That is so cool. Wow. <laughs> Question number three is what's your go-to business resource at the moment, whether it's a podcast or a book or a newsletter? I do love podcasts and audiobooks. Um, I'm a sucker for being time efficient so that I can listen and do other things. I, could, I do a lot of driving around, so just being able to kind of have something in my ear. I generally found when I was building my business and listening to podcasts, like I would listen to startup stories and, and just exactly like we're doing now. I'd listen to people that had built something from nothing that inspired me no end. So that would be my advice there. I still get a lot of value from that. Absolutely. Question number four is how do you win the day? What are your AM or PM rituals and habits that keep you feeling happy and motivated? The thing that I always do is start the day with a new to-do list. So I have like a weekly to-do list. And then I look at what do I want to get done that day? And I literally, as I get things done, I cross it off. And I don't know if it's just me, but it just gives me a sense of achievement. And I can look at that list and go, look at everything I've achieved that day. And rather than just sort of sat around just fighting fires and, and dealing with lots of minute things, I feel like it feels a bit more substantial. So that's my morning routine. I love a good to-do list. <laughs> Question number five, what has been your biggest money mistake and how much did it cost you? Quite early on, I think I placed an order for around 6,000 boxes to carry all my bottles, um, only to sort of realise once the order had arrived and a couple of months later that actually it's six bottles fit in one box because we sell them in cases of, of six. So I'd ordered basically six times as much. So it was like in the tens of thousands. <laughs> and it just meant that we then had to use those boxes for a lot, lot longer than we originally would have done, which was a shame. But um, I didn't want to waste them. So it was a costly mistake. And it just made me realize I need to not rush things and think before I press. <laughs> there was a learning there. <laughs> Painful learning. And last question, question number six is, what is just a crazy story, good or bad, from the journey of building Kalenio? There's one that sticks out. So um, we once got approached uh, for Kalenio to feature in a Hollywood movie starring I think, Jamie Dornan, Ben Stiller. So they, it was for a non-alcoholic cocktail making scene. Um, it was actually before COVID and then the film actually never happened. But instead we got um, a cameo appearance for Kalenia behind the bar in the second season of Emily in Paris. So that was a big moment because I was a big Emily in Paris fan. I was like, oh my God, my bottles are literally on shelf. That is so cool. Wow. Congrats. Love that for you. Thank you. Yeah. So that, that was kind of random, but also quite fun. Absolutely. 
This has been so much fun, Ellie. Thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your journey with Kalenio and everything you're going to through at the moment. It's been such joy. Thank you. No worries. Thanks very much for having me.